everyone. Thanks for stopping into our panel. Um, I hope that you had fun with Pittsburgh Dad. We have Pittsburgh Tony, who <laughs> has been doing it a couple years longer than Pittsburgh Dad, so um, minus the accent. We're here today to talk about fairness and accuracy, and we're not really focusing on how to be politically correct. Uh, we're really just going to examine questions that tend to arise from traditional, alternative, and social media. See, Chris, I got an alternative in there. I'm not sure. Yeah, um, when reporting or analyzing events related to specific groups or populations or issues, or you know, even that language can be kind of fuzzy. So I will freely admit that um, I don't necessarily always use best choices in, in all um, situations. Our format's really simple. Our panelists are going to answer questions. Uh, I'll let you know who they are in a few minutes. We're not really going to do any presentations. I have questions prepared, but we will be very happy to take your questions. We also are live streaming, just so you know that when you ask a question, and um, individuals in the audience are welcome to send their questions via Twitter with the hashtag PCPGH7. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. That's what they told me. Great. Hi. <laughs> um, but just a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. And if you have a question, and then you have a couple more questions, please allow somebody else to have a chance to get their questions in, and then we'll get back around. It's a small enough group. We should be able to let everyone do that. Uh, if you'd like to follow up, you can use Twitter. Now, I did screw up because my I'm going to blame my printer, which is really true. It broke, and I wasn't able to print all the copies of our handout for you. But we have a nice handout with everyone's Twitter account, as well as the st media style guides and other types of things. It's all available on my website. And I'll be happy. You can take my card and just email me, and I'll get you a copy of that if you'd like to have it. I apologize for that. The other thing is, if you ask a question, please ask a question. Don't necessarily put it in the form of your opinion about the topic. If you'd like to share that, that's fine, but try to frame it in the form of a question. Please use language that's respectful, and at the same time, be aware that people may say things that you find offensive. That's just the nature of this dialogue. If everyone is attempting to be respectful, I think we can give them the benefit of the doubt and not let that hang us up. If you want to explain that, fine, but let's you know just try to stay away from letting that be emotional. It's, it's a risk we're taking. And you know, as a moderator, I'm going to try. I may redirect your question to other panelists if we think that's necessary. Let me tell you something that happened to me when I got to Pod Camp this morning. I went up to the desk; it was just perfect, and um, I was signing in. Come on in. Better late than never. Um, Laura, my partner, and I were signing in, and the man signing me in kept calling us girls. And after like the fifth time, girls, 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 I thought. You know, I said, hey, it's kind of ironic that you're saying that to the person who's running the panel on language, and we're going to be talking about that. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, you mean girls? And I said, yes. And he said, oh, are you transitioning from a man? Wow. <laughs> oh. Wow. So I really oh typed out God. vulgar language on my cell phone. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I didn't hear that I was yet. like, he's so good to the wrong person. The only thing I feel is you are dragged me off before I beat him. Oh uh, unbelievable. <laughs> but I wanted to take his picture because I'm just like, this. <laughs> and you know, as soon as I get his picture, it's going into your jab. <laughs> I'm going to find Joanne and say. So, so that was a perfect start. I have no idea what that man was thinking or why he would go there. But it's clearly, Hot Camp is trying to be more professional and reach out to more professional groups, and that is not the way to do it. <laughs> For women, for the trans community, for the gay community, for so forth. So, so uh, uh, let's get started. But yeah, hey, that's fun. Um, so, all right, let's let's get started with a recent political related event. Recently, Jim Roddy, who is currently the chair of the Republican Committee of Allegheny County, do I have that right, John? Is that how you say it? Yeah. And former county chief executive, and still a presence in um, politics. He made a joke that was deemed offensive to people with developmental disabilities, intellectual disabilities, and those who are differently abled in other ways. Um, al along with the cry for an apology was a cry from leading Democrats for Roddy to resign as chair of the Republican Committee. Do you think this, this was a fair and reasonable response to Roddy's comments? And if you want to talk about what Ann Coulter did, 
couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. So, who, any who would like to take that? You want to I'll, no, I'll yield to Tony first, and we can maybe get that long. Well, I think that that Democrats were uh, were overreaching in this case. I mean, asking for Roddy's resignation. Uh, it's it's one thing. I think everyone is allowed to be a jerk, especially when it comes to um, to. I, I think he's he's clearly insensitive about the use of that word. Um, and but I can tell you that. Any number of us in politics and or in the media uh, are, are, are guilty of, you know, these glaring um, blind spots, and and once they're pointed out, I, I think we we have a um, responsibility to adjust our attitudes and our language. Uh, if and even if we don't, uh, unless he is specifically. Um, uh, Unless his, his job or his designation has something to do with um, with that community, um, you can be a jerk. You can be you know you can be blind about how you refer to people. Just like if someone has <coughs> what I would consider racist attitudes or homophobic attitudes, I don't think they should necessarily be forced to resign a job if, as long as they don't have any uh, responsibilities of me. So. I don't know that that may sound kind of. Um, now, Aria <laughs> is with Best Buddies, which is an organization that works with, is it just youth or adults? Um, well, primarily youth, but there are some job training and other programs. But um, certainly with the intellectually disabled communities, um, there's, there's a lot of room there just in terms of education and awareness of the kinds of words you use. And there's this example was perfect, just that we need to have more awareness of it. And, um, you know, as you said, certainly Ann Coulter is one, but there's many other examples we can find of, um, of insensitive use of, of language. And uh, certainly maybe it's an opportunity um, not to be forced to resign, but maybe just to have an you know, exactly. opportunity to open that discussion. I'm just curious, how did people that you work with react to the story about what Roddy said? Were people upset about it? Were people just kind of like, ah, that's just what... Well, no, I mean, certainly there's a response, but I think at a certain point, um, this is a common thing that occurs. So it's not like this is the first time that's ever happened. And, and so uh, it's just sort of like, sigh, Right. What what can we do right. on to certainly try to improve that? Right. And, and let's not forget that that Roddy is, and, and this is where I might be guilty of the same thing, is a seventy something year old white guy who, who doesn't who doesn't quite get it, yeah. you know. And so you make certain allowances. I mean, he's 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 not an evil man. He's an insensitive man. He's a Republican. <laughs> but however, you know, I think that. Um, if people know better, people will do better. Mm -hmm. So I think that there, that education piece has to be taken advantage of in this opportunity. Um, you know, I believe that, you know, as you mentioned, that the word is used by a lot of people. It just so happens in this case, it was a person of power right. or a person that many people looked up to or admired or whatever the term may be. However, I don't want to make excuses for him. I know that you mentioned that he is 70 plus years old, having to be a Caucasian male. However, there comes a point where we have to hold him accountable for it too. So I think that, you know, while we educate him and others that we have the attention of, we also need to hold him accountable. Asking for his resignation may be to the extreme. Um, asking for an apology is acceptable. Exactly. Uh, so I think that there, there needs to be a fine line between the two. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to make sure that when we hear terms similar to this, you know, we need to hold the people accountable, hopefully with an education. Like mm -hmm. I said before, if people know better, people will hopefully do better. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, obviously what was happening there is Democrats were being opportunistic right. about this, right? You always want, whatever Jim Roddy had said, some of you have been calling him for reservation. And Jim Roddy says stuff not unlike this all the time, as right. John could probably, I mean, I've, I've heard him tell very similar jokes about Democrats. I've, I've heard him engage in all kinds of behavior that sometimes reporters look at each other and go, really, seriously? Did that just actually happen? Um, you know, so for, for Democrats to do it, I think, doesn't have the same kind of resonance. If people out there in, in the broader, you know, the real people, uh, as opposed to journalists and uh, politicos, um, were, were to make a fuss about it. And to his credit, Roddy did apologize right. for that stuff. And he actually, doesn't he work for 
Mark or some, uh, some other organizations that actually work in, with In fact, that was his order. defense. Yeah, you yeah. Know? He said, some of my best friends are. Yeah. Oh, never mind. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right. I mean, clearly, clearly, in his mind, it was a dig at Democrats, not a exactly. dig at anybody else. And, and it was just his mistake to um, well, leverage. Let me, let me follow up with that, because it's actually a great question, a great issue here, is that typically, you know, when there's some sort of slur or comment or inappropriate reference, uh, that there are advocates within that community. People speak up and ask for an apology or a resignation or whatever it might be. So Aria, um, how, when you're working with people, um, adults and children who are developmentally, intellectually disabled, I know those two terms are different, but mm -hmm. cover a spectrum. T what we tend to hear are people outside of that group saying, oh my gosh, you shouldn't offend those people. When those people are perfectly able and more capable of saying why the R word offends them than anyone else, so how, you know, who can speak more authentically there? You know, Chris Potter, the editor of the city paper, who certainly has input, or, you know, how do we get those voices? And I'll just follow up with: there was a Facebook meme passed around recently about a young man who filmed his own response and to Ann Coulter's comments using the R word as well, and it was incredibly articulate and well thought out, and um, I heard allegations that he didn't really write it, because of course he couldn't write it. I mean, it's just really sad <laughs> how people do that. So Aria, how did your group and other groups empower young adults who hear the R word every day to tell Jim Roddy why that hurts them? Well, one of the, the things started in the last few years is spread the word to end the R word, and, and that's um, an annual event, and it really has a lot of messaging about it uh, for both communities, um, it, within the, the disabled communities, within the folks that are working with them, and also um, in terms of uh, certainly Facebook and social media is an incredible opportunity to really um, get that message out in, in, a, in a loud and clear way. Um, because certainly while we can say that there's many terms that have perhaps become non-PC uh, now, they're still being used informally, and they're being used in a way that... Um, that is offensive, and, and even though it can be uh, of an excuse that it was not directed at one or another populations, uh, it still is. It is still is there, and it still is being said. And so, certainly, uh, I think people do need to have the opportunity to, to use their own voices in that way. And, and um, certainly, that young man, um, he said, it, I mean, he was he hit, he hit it right on. Um, that message was. If, if you right. haven't seen it, I would encourage you to check that letter out. There. I did have a question for the, uh, the panel, uh, not necessarily about Jim Roddy, but about uh, Ann Coulter's defense of her use of the term. Uh, my understanding is that her defense was that she wasn't actually, and I'm not defending her at all, but I'm just curious as to what everyone thinks of her defense, that she wasn't referring to someone who was at all disabled, she was referring to someone that she thought was, well, stupid, and that her defense was that, well, this is just another element of the word police. Um, I'm That's looking exactly for right, saying. and she used as an example. She mm -hmm. said the, the word "crap" or "idiot," mm -hmm. and she had "moron." She said these are all once uh, technical definitions that have been, you know, uh, used uh, uh, more loosely by folks on, on on all sides of the political. And uh, certainly, as a musical spectrum, term, certainly as a musical term, it does mean slowing down. So, mm -hmm. if, as a metaphor, <laughs> if one is developmentally disabled and <laughs> slower than there is an uh, etymological connection. Right, but we're not, but we all I mean, know what she meant. Oh yeah, when of course. She, when, when, she, when, she, when she used the word, she was she was not at all using it in any sort of elevated sense. No, 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 or no, right. She was using it in the, in the way that she would hope would be the most hurtful way. And and one, I, I don't know what her, her, what her heart says, but what I heard when I heard that word used that way was the the most hurtful word she could use at that time to refer to the president. And whether we would make the connection to someone with developmental difficulties would be up to us. And so, um, yeah, it still doesn't excuse it. You know, I mean, because we have been sensitized to that term in recent years, thanks to Sarah Palin, uh, who has gone after, I, I believe it was... Um, Rahm Emanuel, uh, I don't think Letterman used that term, that's not what got me mad, but I can't remember what, it, she's, she's um, brought attention to that, and you try to be a little respectful of it because of, of that, um, probably the only thing that I would uh, give Sarah Palin credit for. 
but but it's interesting that Sarah Palin has not gone after Ann Coulter because that's a yeah, piece right. who can defend herself. Right. And um, you know, and it's it's really I've been waiting for the last couple of days for 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 Sarah Palin to go after Ann Coulter the way that Michelle Ma Malkin has gone after uh, Ann Coulter and other people on the right have gone after uh, Ann Coulter. I think we have another question. I don't know, mine's actually sort of a comment for which I'll ask you to respond. Is because as a journalist, I confront lots of individuals and organizations and groups who want to frame language, who want to, to basically have us adopt their way of saying things. Right. And it puts people in a very difficult position. I'll give you a, a classic example is the whole abortion issue. Right. I yeah. can't yeah. tell you the number of times that both pro-life and pro-choice people have insisted that we use their language right. to describe exactly. the other guy. Right. Right. <coughs> and I find that very difficult. Right. Um, you know, I'm not the arbiter of language. I actually happen to hate PC when it when it's used to, to limit free speech. I think you have a right to make a jerk of yourself and to say what and use whatever language that you want. Um, you don't have a right to make me say it or to mm -hmm. insist that I use words that you use. But it's the characterization of the other side by one group or another that uh, puts, I think, all of us as journalists in a tough position. I'm just curious whether you've had that experience, uh, and, you, and you know where I'm coming from, I think. Yeah, I mean, so City Paper, because we're all weekly, and we can afford to sort of take sides and be honest about what the sides are, we typically refer to um, anti-abortion people as anti-choice. Yeah. Um, that's just, that's the, that's the decision, that's the choice we made. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm sure they're not crazy about it. But honestly, are they going? They're not going to be crazy about anything I do anyway. <laughs> um, and I have the emails to prove it. Um, so yeah, I mean, absolutely. That's all that stuff can be loaded. I, and and I've I've actually run afoul of it. A, a few weeks ago, we had a story about um, an effort here in the city um, to to ban the use of the question, "Have you ever been convicted of a crime?" on on job applications. And I had to describe that story on the front page of the paper, and I said. I can't remember exactly what the headline was, but it, I used the word ex-cons too, because these were the people who were advocating for it, and and some of some I, uh, there were people who were angry at me for it. Um, and my explanation is as threadbare and unsatisfying as it is, is look, I, I have eighty characters on that space, and I have to describe what this story is. And the word ex-cons is a lot shorter than people who've very recently been accused, you know, convicted of a crime, ask for, you know, whatever. Right. Um, yeah. So, you know, they're, they're, you're always kind of balancing that stuff, both the sort of journalistic shorthand or whatever that you sometimes have to use, your desire to, like, get to what is the story for you if you're writing about, uh, you know, like the, the abortion debate or whatever. You don't want to get hung up in kind of these things. You want to get, like, what's, you know, what's actually the story of the day. Um, the sheer, what Tony and I are up against, you know, word count limits and things like that. And, and nobody in the, in the real world is satisfied by that explanation. In a way, they shouldn't be. Right. But I'm telling you that in, in the context of a deadline or of, of having only so many column inches, mm -hmm. those are the choices that often get that yeah. often get. It, it is the reality that drives a lot of those decisions, and without excusing it. And I think it's an excellent point. Journalistic shorthand, and that should be the takeaway um, for, for everyone in this room um, after this. It's even worse than Twitter shorthand. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, and, uh, and and I can tell you that um, the, the Post Gazette has, has had internal battles and struggles over the term pro life, pro choice, and so forth. Jag off, uh, jag off, <laughs> and it really is. I mean, well and, 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 when, wow. and, and the bigger the institution, the bigger the institution, the the more absurd um, our, our arguments are. I mean, right now we. You know, our publisher and executive uh, editor are really big on honorifics, and so we use Mr. and Ms. and so forth, sometimes for, for total scoundrels, and, um, and we can't get out of that because uh, of their particular uh, sensibilities. And, uh, and so you can imagine when it comes to the, to the abortion question, when it comes to um, um, gender identity questions, uh, the use of the word trans versus transgender, and, and that became a whole thing. I, you know, it never, ever, ever stopped. But what I've learned, I think, over the course of, of, my, of my life and my experience is that you're not going to make everyone happy. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't be everything to everybody. Um, and I also think that 
um, when it comes to terms that we use, kind of going back to Sue's question, um, I believe the importance of the allies is, is important overall, no matter how you look at it. If you're talking about the disability community, it's important for us to identify key allies for us to help us get our voice heard. So if, in this case, you know, if that young man didn't write it, maybe he had an ally which he mm -hmm. scrapped it to, and that ally assisted him in that response. But again, if, if we identify target key important allies, I think that can help all of the, sort of all of these messages be clear, be direct, and you're not, we're not going to make everybody happy at all times. Yeah. Well, tying these issues together um, is the first question, what's reasonable for people to expect? You know, I'm part of the LGBT community. I tend to say LGBTQ. I understand what all the letters mean because I have a blogger and I have to pay attention to those things. But, I, you know, I understand that gay is sure. <laughs> it's three letters, people know what it means, and in most cases when the city paper uses gay, they are talking about bisexual and transgender people as well. Not so sure about other media, but I do understand what you're saying. What is a reasonable expectation from, you know, on our part as members of the community who have these different issues and advocacy, and, and, and maybe Aria and Chaz might, oh look at I just knocked this thing over. While Tony's busy, you can <laughs> Well, I, I, I think it's again about, we're not, you can't please everybody with everything. Um, I think that you've got to have your own personal mission statement and your own personal goals when it comes to advocating. For example, is mine happens to be live, love, live, love, laugh, and leave a legacy. And everything I do goes back to those that key point. Um, so I, I try to um, live my life by that by that statement while um, knowing when to advocate, how to advocate, and for what purposes to advocate. I also try to be, as a guy in diversity, I strongly believe that diversity makes everybody better. Everybody. So if you happen to be a Caucasian male that wears a suit every day, my input, my advice, my life experiences as an African American with a disability can make you better as the Caucasian male in a suit. So I, I really strongly believe that diversity makes all of us better. Um, and, you know, you can't make everybody happy. Um, and a reason why expectation is um, a tough question because people are hot-headed and people are angry nowadays. And, you know, I don't have any children. I always say to my, my, my mom that it would be very tough to raise a child in our culture in today's society because we are in a tough situation, not only as Pittsburgh, as a region, but as a world, we're in a tough situation. So that's a very tough question to answer with the reason accommodation. Maybe my opinion. Right, do you have a I agree that it's very difficult. I don't have anything better than that. Uh, what he said. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, that, I mean, it is. It's very difficult. And um, again, just going back to the, the idea that um, we're, the diversity makes up one better, um, we have an opportunity, again, to, um, to use the language. And while picking which words we use or which ways we frame um, ideas and, and talk about groups, uh, just by, I think, examining which choices, which words fit, um, and which words are most accurate, you know, just by going through that process, I think there's an opportunity um, to educate ourselves and, and educate others. And I think it's also important to, um, at least when it comes to mainstream media, alternative media, is, is give the institution a certain amount of benefit of the doubt and reach out <laughs> um, and, and, and correct, because because you're very good at this, Sue. Um, you know, when there's something in my column or something that, <laughs> something that happens, you know, uh, in, in our coverage, you reach out to, to the writer, and more often than not, that is incorporated into the way we approach it in the future, hopefully. And I think we have to be flexible enough to accept and understand and appreciate your input, and you have to be flexible enough to understand that we are not, I mean, as an institution, out to, to um, uh, we're not out to hurt anyone. You know, we, we don't want to do any harm to any community. Um, what we want to do is accurately portray what the controversy is or what has happened, and, so, and, and maybe our, our, our understanding, because of our lack of diversity, because we don't have enough editors who are sensitive to this, um, we don't use the language that you're comfortable with. And also, keep in mind, language is really dynamic, terms change, 
Yeah. We just don't keep up. I, I was at a, you know, I was on a panel a, a couple weeks ago, and I used the word Negro in an ironic way, and um, a, a, a black gentleman said, hey, I use the word, ne I have reclaimed the word Negro, and I can tell that you are, you know, uh, make, mocking it. Don't you understand there are some people out there who love the term Negro and resent what you are, are, are how you're using it? And it was like, I can't win, you know? Um, so I had to look into the past as well as anticipate, you know, uh, future um, uh, phrases. And so you, you just have to be open to, to change. Yeah, I, I, I'll, very quickly, I just want to build on what Tony said, because the, probably the most important thing I could possibly say here um, to people, because you're out there doing Twitter and social media and all that stuff, and there's a strong sort of synergy, I think, between what commercial media, paid media mm -hmm. do and what you folks do. Um, remember that there are actually like human beings on the other side of these articles, um, and that like reaching out to them often gets produces more results than you could possibly imagine. And, and I'll tell you who really does this well is the right wingers. Anytime I write about gun stuff, yeah. I know like the next day there's gonna be like a, a bunch of emails from these like, you know, gun owners of America or whatever, you know, dressing me down or whatever. I don't necessarily hear from the allies or whatever the same way. And I don't, it's not like I need like the strokes or whatever. I'm just saying that like, there are people who are working the refs pretty hard on, and there's no reason that you all can't do the same thing. Most reporters generally, genuinely crave feedback, even if they're not always crazy about what they get. And remember, a lot of this stuff is, is coming at us pretty fast. There was a few years ago, I don't know if folks remember, there was a homeless person who was transgender who got caught up. There was flooding in the river, I think, and, they, and, they, yeah. and, and she was trapped in the, at, yeah, yeah. At, at the convention center. Right, right. And it was painful watching these poor reporters on TV especially try to figure out like what pronouns to use, we, and I, we, I can't remember we, who it was, we, but it was we, like, we this person, it, it, was, it was this person, this person was trapped in the sewer, mm -hmm. and this person, and you felt bad, because honestly, I had to go look at, like, the media guide when we, like, wrote about that yeah. stuff at all, because you just, this is, a lot of this stuff is pretty new. I mean, when I was in high school, which wasn't that long ago, there was no such thing as a gay, straight student alliance. Mm -hmm. When you think about how far, and it's a really good thing, in just, like, 20, 30 years, how far that movement has come. Um, it's, it's incredible, but you got to realize too that things like just grammar or, the, or, or just sort of habits of speech take longer to change than that. And so there's no reason you can't like work that sort of persuasive angle and work to change that way in a thousand tiny ways. Um, and then you end up with, at the end of the day, something that's a lot more sensitive and a lot more understanding right. of where you're coming from. Right. Why did you have a question? <clears throat> yeah, my, my general question is, is geared more toward there's a lot of bloggers here. <clears throat> today, people that use Twitter, people that use Facebook, um, and all the other various platforms out there. And my concern is that there are there are people out there that Facebook use blogs, use use Twitter, who are have the ability to say and use very offensive language to people. Now the media has maybe a little bit of a control on that, you know, but what what you know? What do you think about the civility or lack thereof, and, and what kind of controls do you have over someone? You know, like let's say that Ann Colder's a blogger, and she regularly uses offensive language because there are bloggers out there that are extremely anti-Muslim, that are anti this, anti that, and use very hateful language. And so, how do we kind of counter that? And how do you hold those kind of people accountable? We never run material from Ann Coulter. So <laughs> that's my contribution to that. I mean, it's it's hard. There's kind of a related question there, which is um, probably one that Tony and I struggle with a little bit more, which is how do you sort of write about this stuff without inflicting it on people all over again, right? How do you kind of document what's going on in some of these places without sort of victimizing your audience all over with that kind of stuff? And there's... There's no great answer to that, honestly. I think you really, there's sort of a fine line between taking something more seriously than it deserves to be taken, and then it becomes, then you become the platform for it. Um, but then you've also kind of got to notify people of what's actually going on. And you, I mean, you can do things like trigger warnings and stuff like that, which I think we haven't really done, I don't think because it's come up all that often, but it's something we'd certainly look at. I don't have a great, I don't have a great answer to that. I mean, Facebook is what Facebook is. I, you know, where it comes into play for us, I think, is in the comment section right. of our of our stories. That's we exactly police it. that stuff on um, somewhat. I've I've deleted those things. I, I noticed the Post Gazette, who I used to tease for not having comments, 
Probably now I feel sorry for ever having done that based on what I saw since then. And it seems like they've just done a lot of stories, a lot of sensitive stories, like a Jordan Miles story related piece. It seems like the post just doesn't have comments anymore. They've disabled them. And I don't know if that's right or not. To be, to be gay, gay stories too. Is that right? Okay. Um, I, I, can, I can speak pr briefly to that. Um, yes, you're, you, you, you've noticed correctly um, we've disabled the comments section uh, because it, it didn't exactly turn out as we wanted it to uh, with the sensitive stories, because I hate to say this, and this has come as a revelation, but there are a lot of racists and a lot of homophobes and a lot of people who just don't like people. Uh, who, even with, uh, even though you have to register through Facebook, um, are are more than happy um, to to leave the worst imaginable comments possible on these stories. And we don't want to look like the, the Beaver County Times or some of the other papers that have had really horrendous um, experiences with this. We rather uh, um, disable, um, you know, uh, judiciously. We don't disable it for every story. I mean, columnists still get the full barrage of, of what's coming to them, good or bad. But if it's a story about race, if it's a story about uh, the transgender community, we know what's coming. And, uh, and and maybe maybe we'll we'll reactivate it at some point in the future. But right now, folks just aren't ready, and we don't want that to to go out to the world. We we if we don't want to just go in there and just uh, deactivate individual comments because we don't have enough people. Yeah. We're not going to pay someone just to be a censor. We just rather say, okay, this is a story that brings out the worst in Pittsburgh. And we, and we won't do that. And to their credit, the Beaver County Times, I was engaging with them because mm -hmm. they had a couple incredibly transphobic, racist yeah. rants, mm -hmm. and they agreed to change their policy. So now what they do is approve every comment because they had what are called trolls, some of them are <coughs> that. And so they finally took responsibility for recognizing that they were giving a platform to people to go far beyond inaccurate reporting and, and get into pointed attacks on vulnerable folks. So Beaver County Times is catching up with the Post Gazette. So. <laughs> uh, third question? I guess I'm just curious, has the Post Gazette or maybe the Beaver County Times considered disabling anonymous commenting? Or is it all you know, associated with the name currently? I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if that would help with I know that they're considering all sorts of things because this is a, a point of contention. You know, I, I don't want to speak too much out of school, but this has generated enormous fights on staff. I mean, there are folks who are, are free speech absolutists who say this is a betrayal of our mission. We should just let 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 you know let it fly. You know, the world deserves to see. The quality of readers we have, <laughs> and the quality of people who are in, you know, and then there are those who say, no, this is this is too much, and so forth, and and so this is actually the, the compromise until we hammer out a way. We thought that uh, having folks register through Facebook would create, would be a natural inhibitor. Yeah, uh, it has not worked that way. Mm -hmm. It has not. Uh, it's it's so, um, we, you know, very, there are people who are very very unhappy. Uh, in fact, we should have had some of the those folks on this panel because um, they could speak with more authority. I mean, there are long faces because of this question every darn day. Mm -hmm. And I want to emphasize that one of well, the point of this is to talk about language being fair and accurate. I think John really came to the heart of that. We're not talking about avoiding offending people. In some cases, of course, you want to be respectful and try to do that yeah. in civil yeah. discourse, but in reporting, you have to stick with the facts. Right. And one of the reasons I actually asked Tony and then I invited everyone else to join this is because I had a discussion with Tony about sexual orientation versus sexual preference. Right. And we discussed, and he listened to me, which was great, why one is, why it's not no longer accurate. And then I had a discussion with one of Tony's colleagues at length about all sorts of interesting um, anal sexual discussions <laughs> because we were discussing whether there was such a thing as homosexual sex or not. John and I have talked about the term homosexual, whether that's accurate and fair. And so I guess I'm just going to throw that out there. 
is, I'm going to switch gears though, away from the gay stuff, because it's so easy for me to get caught up in that. Right now, our community is becoming more and more diverse. Is the term illegals or illegal aliens fair and accurate? Topic-wise. Illegal aliens? Illegal aliens, and the other term is illegals, of course. We hear that quite a bit. Not just in the media, but in general political discourse and societal discourse. So, fair and accurate. I, I can't think of what the alternative would be. Illegal well, aliens. Immigrants. Yeah, yeah. Illegal Undocumented. immigrants? Undocumented. 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 Okay. Mm. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> I'm fine with that. But. I'm going to go... So this is probably an area where um, I'll, I'll run afoul of my own natural base. I have used illegal immigrants um, in, in, in writing, um, and it's generally been in the context of articles that are sympathetic to the cause of people who come to this country without proper documentation. So it's a, it's a matter more of the language that I choose to use. And you know, regrettably, I think this speaks to your point. Um, people who come to the country outside <laughs> the legal parameters of doing so <laughs> are therefore in violation of the law and are doing so illegally in my in my judgment. I find undocumented workers to be a case of um, where I just I just think the language is about obscuring kind of what the stakes are. I think illegal aliens is, is problematic to me because it just makes them sound like, you know, <laughs> um, you know, like they have mind rays or Vulcan control and or illegals. whatever. Illegals. Illegals is also just like again, it's 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 at least if you say immigrant, what you're kind of referring to is the status of their immigration, as opposed to, I think, the sort of Daryl Metcalf, you know, sort of like, they're just out there, you know, running wild in the streets or whatever, these crazy dark-skinned people. So, um, you know, I realize, and I, and I could be, you know, maybe there are people in the audience who feel differently and want to challenge me on this, and I would, I would invite them to do so, because I myself am sensitive to the fact that it's not a comfortable choice for a lot of people. Um, it's one I've made up until this point, because I do feel like it probably gets at you're writing generally about immigration. Um, and so that's the context in which you use it. It makes sense to me from a simple factual standpoint, but I could easily be convinced the other way. And that's what we're going for. Okay. What's fair and what's accurate. Yeah. And mm -hmm. in this sense, the term illegal, immigrant, illegal, resident, whatever, is accurate. It seems to me, it seems right. to make as much sense as any other as anything else I've heard. But I guess I have a rhetorical question I guess I have is, something to think about is, Depending on how it's used, when it's used, and the nature of the article, right. will that dictate or play into how the words proceed? So, if the if the, if it if it's an article about illegals or illegal immigrants that supports that audience, <laughs> are people as aware or as conscious of it if it supports the audience in which the word is used in? So, if I use retarded in the article, but I am supporting that community in my article and the nature of it. Does that make the word way it's perceived different? And I don't know the answer to that. So, but I think that that may be a factor in some of that conversation when it comes to fair and accurate. But that raises a very, and that's an excellent point. But it raises a, the whole question of: Are certain words only allowed to be used by certain people? Yeah. In mm -hmm. which case, you, it seems to me, the English language becomes non-universal. And, and, and we all know yeah. that certain groups want to reclaim. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the word, quote unquote. Reclaim words that others would not, they would be very critical of others using. And is that really fair? And I, I think it's also, you know, something to think about, like even in common speech, in the disability community, we sometimes use the word the C word, we call it the cripple. We say the word cripple. And oftentimes we'll throw that around in our own mm -hmm. circles. But if he was to say it, I'm going to have an issue with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, not me specifically, but I'm saying the community. Yeah, that's well, fair. that's true. That's a very, very good point. <laughs> I, you know, I, I always get in trouble with this, I mean, as a columnist, uh, because I, until our, our, our current editor came along, and he's, he's a um, Northeasterner, Yankee-bred <laughs> um, guy, New Englander, very persnickety. This is on tape, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> he knows. <laughs> I talked to him. He knows. Well, well, in any He's event. Nice <laughs> <laughs> He's very nice. Um, I'm going to be so good. Don't get up to edit that out. So. Um, He's very uncomfortable with, uh, with with some of the racial terms that um, that I've used in the past. Uh, I hate the term N-word, I mean, because I think there's something um, 
um, infantilizing ab about it. I, I, I wish we could, you know, use the word the word openly uh, in the paper because I used it for, you know, uh, for more than a decade before uh, David came to, to to the paper, and now I can't. And uh, and I think that it, it cuts down on the power of some of my. Um, story sometimes. Uh, I can use it in the context of a quote, uh, but I can't use it as in an ironic way or, or any way. I have to, I have to use N-word as the, the unofficial, um, the official, um, uh, you know, I, that is the etymology. I have to use that if I'm going to use it at all, which shackles me. And am I willing to have other people use the, the term? Yes. Because I think that the term is understood. There's a history. There's a context um, in America where we. It's a problematic word, but I don't think that avoiding the use of it makes it less problematic. It just gives it this incredible power. And the fact mm -hmm. is that folks in my community are using the word. So there is a certain double double think going on. It's white liberals who aren't using the term. Yeah, but. I and, can I jump in on this? Because this is, I, I want to push back on what John's saying. As, as a white liberal, as I, probably the one person on this panel who's, like, I'm a wasp, okay? So <laughs> I, I am absolutely, other than the fact that I'm going Kill bald, him. other than the fact that I'm going bald, I am not impressed in any way, shape, or form. Um, I think it's okay, I think it's actually okay that there be double standards. Let's be honest. I mean, your, your question, John, kind of presumes that that there's that we can speak in a way that's completely on neutral ground and that it's not informed by the context. This is Chaz's point, right? Like, if I use the N-word, it's, it's different because I'm a white guy invoking it. The whole context of that discussion is going to be different. Now, if we're having a scholarly discussion and I, and I use it in the context of that scholarly discussion, okay, maybe you make an allowance for there. But let's face it, it's, the usage of that word is already on a different sort of power balance. Mm -hmm. So to say, like, oh, now white people can't use it, all you're really saying is, is white people can't take advantage of the unfair way in which the whole interaction is... Is, is contextualized, right? I mean, we all know this language. It happens in a social context. I just to take a completely random example. I mean, I have nicknames for my wife that if John used, <laughs> there'd be some discussion about like exactly what was going on when I'm working. Like, I'm so, and, I, and I'm sure to say this, and I'm sure to say this here in his house as well. So, I, so I mean, and these aren't words that have any kind of broader social significance. We all use language in different ways based on different circumstances. And, you know, honestly, I, I don't feel like if I felt like I couldn't use the N-word in a column without feeling shackled or whatever, there'd be something wrong with me, I think, right? What would it say about me that I really felt that... Well, it depends on the context. I think that when it, when, when it just disappears completely, I mean, then you run into trouble when you're just quoting Mark Twain. You know, yeah, sure, and, sure. And, then, and and so and that and that gets to be ridiculous. I, I'm not saying that there should there should be you know that that white folks should feel so liberated that they can just say, "Hey, my N word, how you doing, my N word? What's going on, my N word?" You know, the the, the Quentin Tarantino uh, yeah, yeah, uh, presumption because yeah, I, mean, yeah. I think that's the other extreme. But but I think that in, in, in limited, it should it should be sort of like um, it should be like a spice. You know that that if you if you needed it. For a column, if you needed it for uh, a story, you know, feel free because uh, American history, the American context, uh, it's there, it's hanging out there, and and or if, if you if if you can't, which is just like baby language, you know, come up with something else. Just say just say you know racial epithet, something else. But but you know, just having the N word there because you you, you know you can't use the actual word. I don't know. It just it just strikes me as, as and word has fewer characters than racial epithet. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Oh, and we, I kind of want to go back to the illegal alien. Um, I had a feeling you, you wanted to. <laughs> 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 I'm a Spanish teacher, so um, when I think of illegal alien, um, I I come back to the term that like people aren't illegal. You know, an action is illegal. So the idea mm. that if you're talking about the action of crossing a border illegally, that's one thing, but the person is not illegal. Um, it's like so, illegitimate, you know, like when you say someone is, 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 is an illegitimate birth or something like that, that's really, you know. And you're talking about the action, not the right. person. Um, and so that's what I think of when I, when I, when you ask the question, is it 
fair or accurate to use. I think like, well, that's not like people do illegal things, but that doesn't mean that person is illegal because there's Americans who do. Sure, sure. <laughs> yes, I I've been one of them. Um, what, <laughs> what language would you, in the context of a discussion about immigration, if I wanted to talk about people who had, who had who were in this country without the proper documentation, what language would you suggest be used in that situation? I would I would use undocumented. Okay. Uh, in this. Yeah, and I mean, I don't have the answer. Undocumented this. immigrant? Uh, undocumented person, or documented immigrant, undocumented, or just like immigrant, uh, if you're talking, I don't I don't have the answer, I just wanted to throw that. You know, no, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yes. Um, and then I, yeah, okay. Well, the, the one thing we did look up, and again, I don't have it with me, is this the various style guides, and Chris and Tony both filled me in on what they do. Maybe John can fill us in and <coughs> using the Associated Press style guide as well as consulting some other external guides. Now in the gay community there's like 5,000 guides you can go to, but the guide produced by the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defense, GLAD, is considered the, the go-to source. Although I don't always agree with what they say, I'm okay if someone could say I went to GLAD. Um, some media outlets in Pittsburgh are all over the map in how they cover gay issues and other issues in general. So, uh, but we did find, and in fact with the abortion issue, the religious style guide subset of the AP guide has like 17 pages on how to cover abortion. And so clearly someone's paying attention. That doesn't mean it's always right or accessible to people. But John, what, do you consult any guides beyond... Um, common sense. <laughs> Mostly it's common sense, but you know, I, I want there's so many different things I can pick up on, and I know we're going to talk new and old media in our next panel that I'm on. But so I, I, I just I had a couple comments. One, I think your comment was very good. The question of using words as nouns, though, as opposed to mm -hmm. verbs. Mm -hmm. For example, take the R word, which, as directed against an individual, might be considered well, is considered really, really out of bounds. But use the same, you know, what about the verb? You know, you talked about retard as a, as a musical description, or something is, is retarded, or using it in a different <coughs> form when it's not directed as an individual. The word illegal, you're using, that's the context you're using it. You're saying calling someone an illegal is offensive, saying that some act is illegal is not. I mean, these are the, to me, these are the permutations that we're always up against. And I'll give you one that I think, up until, we had a, a former news director, I can say this now, a former <laughs> news director <laughs> at our television station, who went apoplectic when a, our medical reporter used the P word, penis. Oh. He made a beeline to her. He, she was up on the set. She had just finished a report on, I think it was on AIDS or something. And she had just finished her report, and he just, you can't use that word. What's and, what's KDK style? Like, wee wee? Is that like what I mean? <laughs> 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 I mean, all the way up, and what she. He goes away. She turns to me. I'm right there, and I walk right up to her. She, she said, "All the other words I can think of." <laughs> yeah, right. Her words. Get me in more trouble. But yeah. but the news director's concern was that the word penis would give offense. Mm. And so, if anything, at least in television, <coughs> mainstream broadcast TV. I'm not talking about the cable nut cases. I'm talking about mainstream broadcast local TV. We bend, we bend over backwards not to offend. Yeah. And if using the word penis was offensive to some little old lady out there, yeah. we don't use it. So I, this there's is a, a word. constant battle. We're going to pick up on something you said right now. Mental health slurs. I'm an adult with mental illness. It's a common thing. John Schick, Western Psych, murdered somebody. Obviously one of the worst things that's happened in Pittsburgh in a very long time. A reporter from a station was, who was known for being edgy, let's put it that way, was stationed there making all sorts of commentary on John Schick's mental health before they even knew his identity and using the term, do you know who I'm talking, are you whispering about who I'm talking about? Um, you know, I mean, obviously what happened was terrible and there was some sense of, oh, he's at Western Psych, mental illness may be part of the story. But 
you know, in everyday society, we tend to say, People are crazy, they're whack jobs, they're nuts. And then we often misuse schizophrenic to describe people, yeah. Yeah. which I think has done a great disservice to people with just schizophrenia. It's probably the best example. Mm -hmm. He's schizophrenic, which is usually supposed to mean multiple personality disorder, which actually doesn't exist anymore, and now it's called disassociative identity yeah. disorder. Yeah. We won't go there. But that when people talk about schizophrenia, they're terrified now. <laughs> Whereas most people with schizophrenia really present the greatest harm to themselves. So this reporter is saying these things. He's being inaccurate because he doesn't know what's going on. He has no facts. There's no sense of fairness. Mm -hmm. It seems like just a media a ratings mm -hmm. stunt. Right? Yeah. But if we're talking about a critical situation where people's lives were at stake. So mm -hmm. was that, I mean. Can we make the distinction between reporter and commentator at that point? Because that's what that person yeah. is doing. Yeah, they, sure. they, yeah. Does he need to lead though each segment with that, like somehow to convey? Because I don't think he was speaking as a commentator at right. the time. Okay. He's doing what his boss is telling him to do, which is to go on camera and talk okay. and say whatever <laughs> comes to your mind because you're showing the presence there. Right? Yeah. You know, it's all about the pictures. Yeah. I presume they're showing pictures of things going on or behind right. him on yeah. this project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, we've all, I've, I've been in that situation, not in this, I never recover that kind of stuff, but in a political context where you're there covering, you're waiting and waiting for President Obama to show up, and they're expecting you to talk for, for minutes and minutes, and you're just droning on and on and on. <laughs> it's a very tough situation. Yeah, it's, it's existentially, I mean, I don't do it often because I'm print, but, you know, you'll be on a panel discussion on the new, you know. <laughs> And you have to fill time, and you end up saying stuff. You're like, wait a minute, I don't even think that's true. I'm not, I'm not How did that just happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not forgiving him for what he's saying. Yeah. I just know that, that he is under the gun, whoever it is. And I assume that you guys know who he is. I don't know. No. Yeah. You but, know. But I know the pressure you're under. And there is such a, a, tempt, a temptation to say things that are not factually accurate. Well, I will. Well, that you just can't vouch for at that point. That you don't have locked down. And, and the thing is, for me, can do danger because if you if you inflame the public, oh my God, there's a rampaging lunatic in Oakland, and then you have a. I mean, you could really do some damage there. I do want to wrap up because our question, but I, John, I want to say, giving you the benefit of the doubt, when you just said, oh, you went nuts, like to me, that's not a big deal, you know. No, now, a common use of if if yeah. you missed you schizophrenia, I would just be annoyed in an intellectual sense, but I wouldn't be offended by it. But I have to admit that <laughs> some of the stuff that happened after John Shedd, you know, went to Western Psych and he did murder someone, and that was terrible, but um, <laughs> that, that certainly wasn't something we should do. So, let me, um, any other questions? I, I can hear that crowd, I remember that sound. So, panelists, do you have any final comments on fairness and accuracy? Uh, this was actually very informative to me, hearing the, the various perspectives, and uh, I, I really feel that, uh, you know, we have a, a lot to learn and a, and a long way to go, but uh, hopefully, if, if you, if, if nothing else, the takeaway is that we're open, all of us are open to discussion and, and, and being better at this. Yeah, I mean, I have the same thing. It's been very um, informative for me, but I think it, it comes back to just the power of language and, and the power of um, how much weight that a single word can use. And, um, so it's always good to be reminded of that um, as we use all sorts of um, not gates or other right wingers one you use so yeah <laughs> I mean for me I definitely think when I you know, continue and encourage everybody to continue to be open minded um, you know I think you learn the most when you least expect it and you learn the most from people that don't look like you um, so I encourage everybody to continue to be open minded open to the power of language um, and, get, and always be willing to learn yeah and I'll just I'll just say as a final note to pick up on something John said if you're a blogger, if you're a Twitter, you're in the same position as sometimes as a, as a reporter trying to fill Absolutely. time. You feel the need to comment instantaneously on what's going on. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not setting myself out as above this. I, it's the same for me. Mm -hmm. um, about 87% of the trouble we get to, I think, is because we, we start talking a little before we're supposed to. Um, and that's probably something we in the mainstream can worry, uh, worry about all the time. And now, mm -hmm. because of the wonders of the internet, you all have the same headache we do. Um, right. So welcome, welcome to our nightmare. So we wrap up by saying we need to try to give each other benefit of the doubt. <laughs>
Ed, you know, education comes through contact, reaching out to people in either direction and asking them to reconsider the language choices they make and explaining why, and then also realizing that they may not be able to accommodate you. The final thing I'm going to say, and we didn't get into this too much, is that when people park in disabled parking spaces <laughs> and they don't look disabled, give them the benefit of the yes. doubt. That seems yeah. to be the number one thing you know, jagoff.com writes about besides other parking, and that's my you know, personal plea is that. Give people the benefit of the doubt. You know, they have that placard. They didn't steal it from somebody. You know, and, <laughs> and that's the point. That's it. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Very good.